Hi, this is the Social Jello with Angelo show. My name's Angelo. I'm a social scientist, surfer, martial artist, and a whole lot of other things. Coming to you live from Kasai City, Japan, the Social Jello with Angelo show. Hey, what's up, everyone? How y'all doing today? So, if you want to support the show, go to YouTube. If you're listening to this as a podcast, or if you're on YouTube, and just hit subscribe. That's it. That's all I need. Today I interview Hayden, owner of Formula Energy Surfboards. We had a great conversation about surfing and martial arts, some great similarities, and it was a great conversation. I hope you enjoy it. What's up, everyone? I'm here with uh, Eden. Aiden? Eden? Aiden. 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 Well, Aiden. yeah, like, like the Garden of Eden. Oh, okay. So, okay. Aiden. Aiden. Well. And then it's pronounced Aiden? Well, it's spelled E-D-E-N. Mm-hmm. But I guess being in this part of the world, phonetics and... Um, yeah, I just pronounce Eden and just same spelling as in the Bible, the Garden of Eden. Oh, that's a trip. So, okay, he's the owner of Formula Energy Surfboards, and uh, he's from Australia. And I'm now I'm really starting to wonder already. So, like, for the pronunciation, maybe this is I'm I'm like I'm like doing what people do to my name because I have a Spanish name. I feel like. I'm like, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. so my name is Angelo Ferrer, but I don't expect any American to say it right. And since I speak American yeah. English, I, I feel like I'm, I'm, I'm being a Yankee. I'm yank, I'm yanking your, your name. <laughs> if that makes any sense. A little bit, it does. Yeah. yeah. People, no, people do struggle with my name. So, no, but I, oh, go ahead. I would say Angelo. How does that sound to you? I would just say, oh, hey, Angelo. That sounds great. I, 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 people call me Angel. People call me Angelo. I, people call, I, have, I have one friend that calls me calls me Angelo. Like it's like on, <laughs> on top of something. I, 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 yeah. I, don't, I don't care. Like, <laughs> as, long, as, long as, as long as there's an A in there, like I, I'm, I'm cool. <laughs> yeah. So, man, um, quick uh, intro for my audience and for anyone listening. Uh, I bumped into Aiden out in the water uh i'm surfing out here in in japan and we were talking about how uh how he's got his uh he's got his his surfboard company and also he did some wind chun and we just started chatting about martial arts and stuff out in the water and um i really wanted to have him out on the show so i, I really do appreciate you coming out here or not coming out but taking some time to to be interviewed um i guess to kind of open things up uh, how long have you been surfing now, man? Wow. So I'm uh, 49. So I think about this a lot. I've been surfing close to 40 years. All right. So you started. In, okay. So in, in Australia, we all start. Uh, well, we live. Well, most people visit the beach regularly, families. And we start with like um, a styrofoam surfboard or a little, you know, like a bodyboard or a boogie board, you guys might call it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah and and, I, yep. Oh, go ahead. And, and you can start as young as five, six, seven years old, riding, you know, prone on your, on your stomach. And then, and then you step up to like a, a styrofoam um, or a cool, we used to call them cool lights. Do you guys have them back in Hawaii? I think. Um, well, I'm I'm actually back from I'm in California. But, California, um, yeah. San, yeah. I'm from San Diego, but yeah, the uh, I think I think you're talking about the training, the the startup surfboards, like the ones with the foam, so that you don't yeah. get hurt, right? Yeah. So I ironically, so I remember now. They're soft tops. They call them soft, soft tops. tops. Yeah, yeah. So, so the irony with surfing is they're very much. They're in fashion now again, those styrofoam boards, but they're obviously way improved with slick bottoms and better materials on the deck. But, yeah, back in the day, that's how we started surfing when we were little kids. Um, 
Yeah, that's uh, so you, you, I guess that would kind of answer my second question whether like you're a purist or not, right? Like, so some people, some surfers feel that there's like this. I, I want to say there's categories to surfing. You got you got your body boarders, your boogie boarders, the, your average beach goer who's a boogie boarder in, in in California anyway. You got your boogie boarders that are supposed to stick to the swimming section. You got your body boarders with the fins that piss off the surfboarders for going into the surfing section with their fins. And then you got the short boarders and then you got the long boarders. And some people are really purist about, oh, and now you have the sup boarders, the people who uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> the people that come in from, you know, almost a kilometer out riding the wave before it's even a wave. It's just like a, a swell. <laughs> yeah. And some people really get mad at them. I, I personally, I do all of the above. I started as you at around six or five on a boogie board and I, did, I transitioned to, to stand up surfing a little later in, when I, in my teen years. But, um, yeah. So have you ever competed? Yes. Yes. I grew up sort of, um, in the, the early eighties was when I was a young teenager and, uh, competition was, um, part of surfing in those days or, or striving to be a good competitor and we used to have um, uh, what we call a local board riding club and we've had uh, like world champions come out of that particular beach and surfing competition was a big part of growing up as a kid in Australia. And for, uh, for my listeners that have never experienced surfing or maybe don't know much about how a surf competition works. And maybe a lot of these guys come from martial arts backgrounds. So I know the similarities, but maybe you can just kind of break down how exactly do they determine who is a champion in a surfing competition? I guess this is going to be a two part question. So yeah. I guess for the starters, how do they, how do they determine who's a better surfer, I guess, for the competition? Yeah, that's a that's a great question. That's that's a very difficult um, thing to understand if you're not a surfer. Um, but I'll do my best. <laughs> <laughs> um, so surfing is an extremely subjective sport, as like you've sort of mentioned. There's so many different types of ways to surf a wave, but primarily you've got shortboarding, which you know people out there probably know, like Kelly Slater and. Um, I don't know, Australian champions like Mick Fanning, and they're all world champions in, in the shortboarding discipline, if you like. Now, to explain, I guess the most simplest way is you ride the, the biggest, best wave um, with, I'll try not to use too many technical words, but <laughs> the, the new criteria, which is like, um, just been rejigged is speed, power, and flow. But that's kind of probably doesn't help your listeners too much, does it? Like that. That's, <laughs> well, I think I think yeah. for, for martial artists, if you're a martial artist, you, can, you you have an idea of what these three things are. Yeah, yeah. If, Good if you're, call. If you're not a martial artist, then I feel sorry for those people because they're going to be really lost. <laughs> but as a martial artist, like speed, power, and flow, like the idea of how. How fast are you moving? How are you transitioning into the next movement or technique? And then, uh, as far as power, like how much power are you? How much power are you using when you're executing the techniques? Right. Exactly. So, this is probably getting a little bit ahead of the explanation. But if you see a guy take off on a wave, and it's the, the best wave, the biggest wave that comes through in that competition window that's at 20 30 minutes and he's surfing um with 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 no downtime so he's just powering down the line and he's coming off the bottom this is where he gets all these words people are like what are all these words coming off the bottom and <laughs> top turns <laughs> but if he transitions in the in the uh the steepest part of the wave uh, effortlessly with, with those things in mind, speed, power, flow, in general he gets scored the highest. And they have a panel of judges and the judges have a, 
a scoring scale from one to ten, and obviously ten's a perfect score and one's not a very good score. And they tally them up, and at the end of the heat, end of the time frame, the guy with the highest points wins, basically. And then for those of you that uh, that maybe have never seen a surfing competition, uh, he mentioned that twenty three minute limit. Oh, yeah, 20, 30. It depends on the conditions, but yeah. anything from 20 to 40 minutes to an yeah. hour. Yeah, like on average, in San Diego, most of the amateur competitions, you had, you had a 30-minute heat. Yeah. And um, 30 minutes maybe to a martial artist sounds like a long time. But uh, if you're – just to kind of explain to people that don't surf, depending on the size of the waves and whether or not they're assisting you – with the jet ski to pull you out. I know I came up from a, from a earlier days where they did not have assistance. You had to paddle out. So part of your heat was getting out there. Um, it can be really challenging to try to catch as many waves as you can. So this is where the endurance part of surfing comes in because you're trying to paddle out there. And you only have 30 minutes not just to catch your wave, but to get out there and fight the surf to get out there. And if it's a really good day and the waves are, are pumping somewhere between, you know, overhead, uh, in the terms you might understand, they're like two meters. Uh, for the people that don't know what two meters is, you know, six feet, about six feet, a six-foot wave or higher. Paddling out, depending on the, on the break, will take you sometimes, what, five to ten minutes? For sure. Yeah, if, if you're lucky, <laughs> no. if you get if you if the heat started on the right time and all that good stuff, right? If there's a rip current that helps you out, so it can be really challenging for that endurance. That's what the endurance. That's why surfers are in such great shape. Um, yeah, so th- these are all yeah, like these are all factors that that um, it's very hard to learn unless you just do it a lot. I don't know if that makes sense, but yeah. learning rip currents and, 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 you know, waves don't always come in at the same time. You've got sets and it's, it's a, it's a hard sport to appreciate if you're sort of haven't surfed, I guess, I guess <laughs> that's the point I'm trying to make. Yeah, it is. It's really hard to explain to people because, you know, when they, if a person has never surfed before, the only experience they have with it is whatever they see on tv or youtube or when they're scrolling through their facebook feed which is like the finished product right a professional riding exactly riding the best wave um already on the wave they've already taken off sometimes a lot of the clips are already them just powering down on the perfect line and coming up and doing some really to make this really easy for the people listening jumping in the air and spinning gracefully and then landing perfectly so they see that and they imagine that's what surfing is and they totally don't see all the other elements like the idea of having to fight the currents to get out there what it takes to learn like i saw a really good uh, interview with a professional surfer on a, on another podcast that talked about how he explained how some people can surf their whole lives and just suck you can spend your whole life it's not the kind of sport you're not guaranteed anything like and that's the weird thing about i think i think the same can be said about martial arts too but even then like even martial arts i don't think i think even in martial arts like yeah maybe some people can spend their whole life learning a martial art and still suck at fighting because they just never were really good at fighting i think that's a better analogy yeah, um, that's a very good analogy. Is like you can spend your whole life surfing and still suck at surfing, just like someone who can spend their whole life practicing martial arts but suck at fighting. Yeah. Because uh, there's just elements that you can't control, and some people don't really know how to handle that uh, that variable. Yeah. But I think, like, to sort of keep it, like you say, oh, people suck at whatever sport they do. But that's a subjective thing, especially in surfing. So you might not have the best style or you know you might just generally suck at surfing but you love it you know you just you love getting up early and you know calling your mates and we're gonna go you know and especially here like people drive for hours and that's such a big part of it and 
I guess too with martial arts, it's the, it's the same. Like you guys have gradings and belts, and you know, not everyone's going to be you know a, a UFC fighter, right? But people still come to the gym and they train hard. And and I, I think about this a lot as I get older. I, I guess like I think what it is 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 in those moments the world's so busy these days, and there's so much information we get through our phones and computers and tv but whilst you're surfing or training you're so focused on or you you just concentrate on that thing and that thing alone and i think that's the addictive thing for humans does does that make sense what i'm saying like the process enjoying 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 the, the process you know and that's what a lot of people are uh, don't get in their lives, and the people who have found it seem to flourish. You know, really enjoy it. Yeah, I, I think that's the same. That's what I think. I, I always felt like surfing and martial arts are so similar in that, like, if you don't give up, that's really important. As long as you don't give up, whether or not, and like I said, it, it's subjective, right? It, it's very subjective. What's a good surfer? What's a good martial artist? Well, that keeps changing. As time, as the sport keeps evolving, uh, something that may have been considered a really good surfer or someone who had been considered a really good martial artist maybe 10 years ago is not considered old news to what's happening because that sport keeps evolving and it keeps pushing the, the competition side to be at a level that keeps getting more and more amazing and incredible that it makes what happened 10 years ago suddenly seem irrelevant. So if you've been doing it for a long time, that subjectivity keeps continues to change even more and more. So like, with being involved in the actual sport, if you don't give up, like I always say this to people all the time, in surfing and in martial arts, like in martial arts, you may feel that a particular style is completely irrelevant to actual fighting or to what you see happening in the UFC, but. If you look at a person who has never trained and never fought anyone, never even thought about fighting ever in their life, and they were to fight against someone who trained in any art, even an art that you might think is irrelevant, the person who trained is still going to have a better chance because they've trained in something. They've done something. And especially if they're dedicated in what they train in, you might be surprised. Now, Surfing, same thing. Like, if you grab someone who's been trying to surf or has been, you know, just doesn't give up, keeps paddling out, maybe they can't ride the wave like Kelly Slater, but they've at least figured out how to paddle out and catch a wave, they're going to do better than the person who decides to paddle out for the first time because that person has no experience in it. So even beyond the subjectivity, you can see that. If someone's never surfed before and they just decide to grab a surfboard and try to paddle out, compared to the person who's already been doing it and didn't give up, there is a difference between the skill level. For sure. And I think, too, like, just on that sort of mindset, like the two the two sports or two pastimes of martial arts and serving, is, is you got to have a holistic approach, too. Like, you could, you, you've got to look after your body if you want to uh, keep doing those things. So I think they go hand in hand as well. You know what I mean? Like just paddling out or you can't be like super unfit. I mean, you can, but you're not going to enjoy yourself. <laughs> no. And then the same if you go into a, I'd imagine if you're training like jujitsu or like a high sort of where you're exerting a lot, in my, like a boxing, like if you're really unfit, you're not going to go, you're not going to last, are you? Like, more than 20 30 seconds and you're not going to enjoy yourself so there's that sort of that crossover of 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 a lifestyle which which i find really interesting and and um you know challenging but really interesting yeah yeah and and again i think but again you really hit it on on the head when you talked about how it's about it's about enjoying the process and when you find the right group of people, the right communities within surfing and martial arts, uh, you just kind of motivate each other in such a positive way. Uh, and that, that's what I think I love about 
both surfing and martial arts. Like when you find the right communities within that, I, I don't want to generalize and say it's all like that all the time, but like when you do find those communities that are like that, you push each other in a positive way to get better and you, and you help each yeah. other, and you help each other, yeah. out, which I think yeah. is a really cool aspect. Like when I first paddled out, I finally learned how to surf and, uh, I remember for the longest, I didn't want to transition to a short board because uh, I had a horrible time learning how to surf. It was horrible. Like, <laughs> oh, surfing is a really hard sport to, <laughs> to learn. It's a terrible sport. It's so, it must be so frustrating for people, you know. Yeah, no, it was, it was awful. It was, I had a really rough start. When people ask me about how long I've been surfing, I, I tell them, you know, I've been surfing, let's see, 9, 19... I've been surfing almost, uh, it'll be 30 years next year, but the first 10 years, I have to say, I have, I was surfing unsuccessfully for the first 10 years of the surfing. <laughs> like, it's just, yeah. Just really bad. A lot of, I would say the first, particularly the first six years, uh, at one point I almost gave up because the board came back. But every time, not even just one point, but one time, it was like every time I tried to paddle out, I'd get my nose busted or the board would crack my head open. I, the, the surfers would kick me out of the water because I was bleeding and they didn't want sharks to show up. So <laughs> like, so like, <laughs> that was like my first my first six years of surfing to the point that I almost gave up. And one of my friends who was a surfer, he's like, come on, man, like, come out with me. It'll be fun. I'll make sure you don't get hurt. And I'm like, oh, all right, I'll, I'm going to give it one more shot. And I, I started trying to do stand-up surfing at 16. Bodyboarding was great. I had no problem bodyboarding. I can, that, that community and that type of surfing was easy for me. But particularly, like, the hard top. I never went soft top. I went straight to hard top. It was a big mistake. But, um, <laughs> but my, my buddy had me come out with him. He had his longboard. And uh, I had my bodyboard. And uh, he paddled out on his longboard. And I, I caught paddled out. And we out. In the deep water, we switched out, and it was a small day, maybe like three feet, uh, one meter, and um, which is for those people listening up to your waist, maybe just a small wave. And uh, my my buddy's like, "All right, there's your there's your wave." And I already knew how to catch waves. It just it was when I stood up, the shit always hit the fan. So I caught that first wave, and I, I get up, and I remember standing up on the longboard and thinking to myself, "All right, so now is the time where suddenly the board." slips from under me and flies in the air and hits me in the face or something <laughs> <laughs> horrible. And, uh, for the first time ever, it just, the board, cause it was a long board and I tried shortboarding the first time. It was such a nice long board. It just kind of, it was already stabilized. I just had to keep my balance somewhat. And I was finally riding a wave and this feeling of accomplishment came over me after like five years of failing at it. And, so I really held on to that longboard for a long time. I longboarded for the first three years of surfing. And I remember one time it was a bigger day. The waves were double overhead because of El Nino, giant tubes. And most of the people out on this spot that I was in were shortboarders. And I was sitting there on my longboard about a nine foot. It was a little smaller. It was a shorter longboard. Some people would say it's not a longboard. It's like eight feet, nine inches. It's kind of a shorter longboard. And I was carving. I was car carving. Okay. For people that aren't that understand, I was going up and down the wave and going in these motions that sweep the board and kind of like it's imagine how do I say this? Like S turns? We say S turns. Yeah, I know S turns, but I'm trying to figure out how I'm gonna explain this to people that never served. <laughs> oh, okay. uh, uh, you you're kind of making you're drawing an S into the wave. I think that's yeah. To, to, to explain an S turn, very hard to to explain. Yeah, um, coming off the bottom and off the top. Yeah, top bottom. Okay, <laughs> so, so going up and down. Up yeah, and down. Yeah. 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 You're going down the line too. Yeah, in style. Oh, okay, you're going down the line. <laughs> you're standing in a line. Okay, yeah. <laughs> but yeah, if I was doing that, and uh, after I was done, I got off the other end, and a shortboarder walks up and he's like, "Hey, man." I think it's time to let go of that longboard. <laughs> I'm, like, I'm like, really? Like, I'm kind of attached yeah, to it. <laughs> but you, yeah, that's the funny thing about surfing too. Is like, obviously, I wasn't there, and but you're not sure if he's complimenting you or he's like, you know, he's having a dig at you. Like, he's like, hey, 
you're getting too many waves and you're kind of ruining my day or no you're going really well you're not sure like surface have this dry irony you know yeah yeah and so like I, I took it as a I took it as a compliment. I took it as a compliment. <laughs> and, and I also, it also kind of sparked the idea of maybe he's right. Like, I know he's complimenting, like, the fact that I'm, I'm using my longboard as you would a shortboard. Yeah. But maybe it is time to try shortboarding again. And that's when I went back to shortboarding. Yeah, nice. But you were lucky. You got good advice. And that, that was what, again, like, hearing your story is perfect. The community I was talking about, right? Like, I got yeah. involved in that community that really. My friend, yeah, but that, all, all that. He, that guy pulled you aside and, and took you to a, a, you know, a location where it wasn't so crowded. He gave you the right board. He, he encouraged you. Um, and then you took off on that first wave and that was it. He was like, oh, this is me forever, you know. <laughs> and that's so important. So many people don't get that advice. Yeah. So, yeah. Like, it, like, and that's why I said it's so important to find the right community. And that, that doesn't just happen in surfing, right? This happens in martial arts. And when it happens in martial arts, it's just as brutal as my surfing story. And some, I, I'm not, I'm not going to say worse. I'm going to say it's just as brutal. Like, I sure. You walk into the wrong jujitsu studio or you walk into the wrong MMA club or even the wrong Taekwondo karate school and... Uh, and the instructor isn't isn't looking after the safety of the of the new students, and they're just crushing white belts to make their higher belts egos feel better, or maybe they're getting for ready for a competition and they just don't care about the newcomers and they're just trying to practice their techniques. But it happens in martial arts too. You walk into the wrong place, you get crushed. Their approach is to crush is is a survival of the fittest mentality. And I mean, there's there's a place for that, but it's really hard if you're a newcomer and you come into a place and you just get stomped on and some guy's bashing your face in and and you get hurt and you have to go to the hospital later and you signed a waiver so it's not like you can complain about it. And a lot of people get discouraged by that kind of same experience by, by finding the wrong community as they come in, right? Yeah, that's a great analogy. It's perfect. Yeah. But yeah, man, sorry to rant so much about myself. I try not to do that. Um, what about you, brother? What, what challenges did you face as a surfer? Challenges as a surfer? Well, we can go pretty deep here, but I don't want to scare your audience, you know? <laughs> well, you can go as deep as you want, man. Whatever, um, whatever you're comfortable sharing with the internet. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> no, one will, no one will know. No one will know. Um, um, I guess growing up, I grew up in... Um, in Sydney, Australia, in a, in a what we call like an urban beach, probably similar to some beach in LA, like um, what's a like Huntington Beach? Huntington Beach, yeah, yeah. So you're on the edge of the city, and it's 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 heavily populated. You're a massive um, different types of people living there. You know, people that enjoy the beach, people that just live live there because it's near the city, whatever. Um, and I guess. Surfing, look, you always want to get better as a surfer. Um, but, yeah, I guess a little bit of a darker subject was, was the drugs associated with surfing and, and that, that culture growing up in the, the 80s and, and early 90s as a young person. Um, luckily today, kids are way more smarter, way more educated. But we didn't have internet and... Um, we just relied on our peers, and um, as you probably know, most surfers didn't like working back in those days, so they often had um, unusual jobs or different types of jobs, and surfers' dreams were always to travel to exotic locations like Indonesia and, you know, even those days, Hawaii, um, the Pacific, to find uncrowded waves. So... You needed money. So a lot of older guys probably did stuff that was, you know, um, illegal. And and these guys were the good surfers. You know, when you're a young kid, probably you did as well, Angel. You look up to these guys because they, they, they were the better surfers at the beach, you know. 
So, yeah, I guess that was one of the main challenges of, of, of staying on the right path and understanding what was right or wrong. You know, and that's something that that um, you only really find out when you put in that situation as a young person. Like your parents can help you and your, your peers can guide you, but when you're in that situation where you've got to make a choice in life, um, that, that was a challenge. And how did you how did you find yourself? Like in, in the middle of all that, you had to figure out what was going to be right and wrong for you. And yeah. at one point, where, where did you find to say, you know what? And I think this happens to a lot to a lot of people it's in the surfing community quite a bit, right? But there's that point where there is that darker side of surfing where there's that there's that party element, which um, which a lot of people don't talk about, and um, you know, you, you yeah, you no, know, not just surfing. I want to say like, I guess it depends on where you were brought up, and I, I can speak from San Diego. I think about San Diego, California. I was actually brought up in a in a rough neighborhood called Escondido, and in my area, uh, everyone had. Uh, a dark part of their chapter in their life where they had to make a decision on whether they were going to live their life partying every day or whether they were going to be productive members of society. Not that partying is a bad thing. I'm not criticizing it, but there was beyond partying, like, you know, I, I'll, I'll, I'll just be really blunt. Like in California, uh, marijuana is legal. I'll say that right out. And there's nothing, I have nothing against smoking weed, but um, even before it was legal, there was still like, in the neighborhood I lived in, it was people that would spend, like their life became smoking weed, like that was their identity. And I met surfers that were the same way, like surfing was part of their identity of being someone who smoked weed. Like I'm a weed smoker. Like that's what I do. And there was that and not nothing against it. That's your thing. That's totally cool. I'm not knocking the idea of smoking weed. And I know there's a, a large section of people that smoke weed and are very productive. And I'm not necessarily talking shit about that either. I'm talking about more about people that kind of just they do fit that stereotype of someone who who only smokes weed and only wants to smoke weed and have a good time and not actually work or do anything. And then also there was an even darker side in my neighborhood where there were people that weed at the time before weed was legal was not that accessible. And in my neighborhood, it was actually easier to get crack. So, yeah. so yeah. what would happen is a lot of people went down that path where they just wanted to smoke some weed but back then, before it was legal, you bought weed from a guy who was a gang member because that's who controlled all the drugs. So a lot of times your gang member, they wouldn't just have weed. You know, they'd have, they'd have crack, they'd have, uh, they'd have some cut up cocaine, which was not exactly the purest, and they would also have heroin. So a lot of people did get sucked into this thing where, you know, again, I, I'm not... Uh, yeah, I have a master's in psychology. I always mention that before I start rambling. and I'm just like ramblings. I'm not one of those proponents that say that weed is a gateway drug. I don't actually say that. Actually, in psychology, what we say, is the, real, the real gateway drug is actually, if we're going to look at substances, is actually alcohol. Because that's if you're going to say you're gonna, you want to live a life of sobriety, well, that's going to be kind of blown out the window the second you start saying, I'm going to start drinking. Now, from there, whether where you take it, it goes into different, into different avenues. And then in the research for psychology, they actually found that uh, some people will drink and never do any drugs. But one other drug that is a gateway drug that they found correlational studies is between smoking cigarettes. So actually, if, you, if you're willing to smoke cigarettes, you're willing to smoke something else. And that's... There's been correlational studies that have been done with people that sm smoke cigarettes that admitted to doing other drugs. That's not always the case. Again, we can't generalize this stuff. But um, 
again, I'm not proponing that that anything is. I'm not a big proponent of the whole idea of a gateway drug, but I will say that some people, from a psychological standpoint, and you've met these people, don't have a very strong resistance towards substances, and they can end up in a in a whole array of social issues because they just don't know when to say no. Yeah, I think you've hit the nail on the head from my experience too. That you know, look. I'm not yes or no, it's a personal choice, but some people aren't designed to smoke pot. <laughs> it's, yeah. just, it's just, that's, you know, um, a layman's way of explaining, like, and that's my experience with some people, you know, and some people can go out socially, you know, have a drink, have a smoke, uh, uh, they're fine. But there are there's an element of the population for sure that ha, ha, drink and and trouble happens. And there's an element that smoke, uh, what we call it pot marijuana. Yeah. And you can tell they're affected. They're affected um, in their normal daily life. Just their their um, this this is my experience, and I can't speak for the rest of the world. But I have a lot of friends, and so I'm I'm in my my late forties. And um, a lot of these people smoked a lot when they were young, and they're definitely different. Like they're definitely their whole a lot, lot of um, their their concepts on that they're the victim. Does that make sense? There's this victim thing going on with them. Whether it's just um, the way life's played out for them, but you see a, a relationship with heavy pot smokers. And this victim uh, mentality, you know, the government's no good, this is no good, they're always getting in fights. There's nothing to do with when they're smoking, it's just when they're just going about life day to day. Yeah. But um, I see that. We see that. I see it. Um, but, again, that's just my opinion. Yeah. And, you again, know? and you mentioned it again, like, we're not generalizing here. We're not saying that people – all people that smoke weed take on this mentality of uh, of not trusting the government or not just that. Like, I, I would say, again, I mean, and I know because, like, again, like, I come from a state where it's legal. And, um, and I, you know, I, I've openly talked about how, you know, when, you know, when, it, when I was there and how that worked, you know, I, I did, you know, I have nothing against smoking weed. I've smoked weed in the past. But I do know people that it became their identity. It's, it's, one thing yeah. to, it's, it's one thing to say, like, hey, I like to have a drink. We'll, we'll, we'll put this for people that have never smoked weed before. Like, I like to have a drink every so once in a while to relax. There's a difference between that and someone who feels that drinking is who they are. Like, that's me. I, I'm a quote-unquote drinker and i guess it, the difference is that with alcohol it's called it's it's more called alcoholism so <laughs> the kind of yeah. people that say yeah. i'm a drinker and they're sitting there pouring whiskey into their coffee in the morning to go to work um it's not the kind of identity that's exactly uh what can i say praised like if you if you were to say you know i need to have a drink in my in my coffee before I go to work, that's not the kind of thing they exactly can advertise. But within the weed smoking community, if you're someone that starts your day smoking and then you don't do anything all day, and that's kind of like your thing, like I'm gonna wake up in the morning, uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna smoke, and then I'm just gonna hang out, and then maybe I'm gonna surf, and I'm gonna come back, and I'm gonna smoke some more, and um, and I'm really not interested in working or going to work or or really no ambition to really do much more than have the identity of a than of a, of a weed smoker i'm going to sell weed and a lot of the people do they all they sell weed too so it's really part of their identity as far as that's concerned and i, and I want to differentiate that i know people that are the difference between that and like they have this identity thing with how they sell weed. And I've also met very, very driven people that now that weed has become legalized, like the same people that I saw that were working for the medical marijuana community 
they had a very different approach. Like, yeah, they smoked, yes, they smoked weed every day. Uh, the way it affected them was maybe, I guess it has to do more with the identity thing. Like, yeah, they smoked weed every day. But they wouldn't exactly be walking around with Grateful Dead t-shirts on or trying to advertise the fact that they even smoked weed. And I think more, well, one of the biggest reasons is because they still knew it was federally illegal, so they weren't exactly in the mood to try to let people know what they were doing. And they were still very driven, though. They had a, they had career ambitions. Um, they they looked at weed, they they looked at weed as a business plan for them, and they eventually, when it became legal, they started their own companies and everything like that. And again, I think that's different from the kind of person that's completely unmotivated. Totally, yeah. totally. But I mean, the good thing too is, I think about this debate is, it's quite a um, sensible debate. You know, the world today gets so hijacked when someone says some people just get outraged all the time. It's like, this is what the world's about now. You know, you're either on the left or the right, you know, and there's no middle ground. But the good thing about the marijuana debate is that there is a good middle ground and hopefully, you know, it's obviously helping a lot of people, you know, I don't know exact sicknesses, but I think it's like, is it autism? Yeah. There's a, there's a whole list of, um, of different diseases, uh, mental illnesses and, uh, and also chronic illnesses that that they're finding that uh, that cannabis is helpful for. So yeah, autism is one. Um, there's also seizures. It's been helping. It's been helping some patients with epilepsy and uh, and specifically, yeah, epilepsy was the other one. They they found that for some people, again, it doesn't work for everyone because if you look at any medication, medication from a medical standpoint doesn't work for everyone. That's why we have side effects, right? But um, yeah. but they do. They have found that cannabis can be used for people with epilepsy to avoid seizures, which is great. Yeah, so. and I mean, you just hope they they get the the right people who make the laws who are sort of, um, you know, they're not they're not um, hijacked by these other sort of radical thinking. They just get and and they can make make it accessible to the right people who really need help, you know, that'd be cool. That's, that's an encouraging thing about this conversation. Yeah. Yeah. So you decided to get focused. You decided to stay away from, from things that you felt for you personally would keep you from achieving your goals. Right. Yeah. Well, yeah, sorry. And from there, you're obviously the owner of formula energy surfboards. Yeah. And when did you decide to make that transition? Like, surfing is something you love to do, but I think I'm going to start this career based on, on surfing. Sure. How, so, how did that happen? Sure. So I, um, I, I worked in uh, many other industries prior, and about uh, 15 years ago, uh, an opportunity came up to start this brand. And um, at that time, the timing, and, and I was really passionate about doing it. And, uh, yeah, it just sort of fell into it as, as often happens. And then it became not only my, my, my passion or my hobby, if you like, but my life, my, my work. So the two, and they always say if you can do, you know, what do they say if you can if your work is like your, your passion, then you never really go to work, right? You just you wake up every day wanting to go to work, you know, because it's what you do anyway. So, yeah, that's sort of a pretty vague explanation, but that's how it all came about. And when did you carve your first surfboard? Uh, so I started about 15 years ago. So um, I... I were, uh, became, you know, it was a massive learning curve, the way boards are designed, made, the production, um, and primarily surfboards have been being made the same way for the last, I think it's years, probably 50 years, same materials. Um, so the guys who make, the boards are, are really old school, you know. They're they're like they've been doing it a long time, and 
And, um, yeah, I fortunately met um, a great bunch of, of experienced craftsmen and they guided me the right way and here I am still doing it some 15 years later. That's really cool. Learning every day. What, what brought you out to Japan? Um, so my partner's Japanese, my wife. So um, we, she has lived in Australia for 25 years now. And um, a couple of years ago um, she mentioned she'd like to live in Japan. And I was like, oh, I don't know about that. <laughs> <laughs> Did you meet her? So you met her out in Australia, huh? Yeah. Yeah. We've been together like 27 years, I think, now. Jeez. Time flies. <laughs> um, and anyway, she said, geez, it'd be nice to go live in Japan. And I was like at this stage in my life where I was trying not to say no a lot. I don't know if that's a weird thing, but, you know, like, I don't know if it's a, it's a, it's the thing that happens as you get older. Just everything's no, no, I'm not doing that. No, I'm not going there. So I've tried to live by that sort of um, way, and, and that I'm going to just try and say yes to as many experiences as I can. You know, within reason, obviously. <laughs> yeah. And I was like, okay, well, let's let's give it a go. So yeah, that's why we ended up here. And coming out here. What are some differences that you've noticed between Japanese surf, surf culture and Australian surf culture? Differences. Well, God, that would be another pod. That would be like, we could talk about that for days. <laughs> <laughs> I guess, let's, before we say differences, because I, I think that might take us to a, I don't want to say negative, it, 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 it will, well, I've got one negative. I've got one negative, which is actually not a negative. It's kind of a good negative okay. in a way. Okay. Okay. Uh, localism. All right. Which which is alive and well in Japan in some places. And if you want to break down, what is what what would you feel? What do you feel localism? How, how would you explain localism to someone who, who doesn't? Um, so, so basically. Um, uh, a certain beach or a certain surf break is controlled by the people that live in the area. And if you're an outsider, you're not welcome to come and surf there. And, and they make it quite clear to you that you're not welcome to come there. And, and if you try and surf there, they'll, they'll, uh, you know, get the, they'll, they'll tell you straight out, you know, go away. Um, um, I, don't think it would come down to violence, but they intimidate you in a way where you, you, you feel uncomfortable, so you, you wouldn't go back there, you know. And, and that's um, that was alive and well in surfing back in the day, and it's slowly become, uh, you know, a non-issue these days because of the way the world is. But surprisingly, here there are some places that it exists, and it's it's kind of interesting. You know, I know, you know, like the place I, I met you the other day down on the, that island, um, that I was told that's a very localized break. So you, you might know a lot more about it than me, Angelo. Um, but, but my, I was told to be careful there, be, be courteous, um, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. That, that's that particular spot that we were at. Like I told you, the first time I, I rolled up to that place, I wasn't the one driving. My wife was. And when she drove up and asked a surfer where the parking spot was, uh, the surfer pretty much said, oh, there's no parking yeah. for people that aren't from around here. So if you park, the police will tow your car. Yeah. So, so my wife believed him. And uh, and she said, okay, I guess we got to go to a different beach. <laughs> Yeah, and um, which is kind of you're like a very Japanese thing where, yeah. like, you, you just no one tells lies here. So, oh, okay, I believe what you're saying, but he's like flat out lied, uh, <laughs> flat out lied yeah. to make you feel uncomfortable, you know, and go yeah. to basically go away. Yeah, you know, yeah. And since, and since my I, I didn't question it because I'm not from around here, so I'm like, oh, I guess they have a law that 
I guess this town only has parking for for locals, and there's no parking for people from outside. Whatever. <laughs> so, like, yeah. I'm, not, I'm not in the U.S. So diversity is not expected. So okay, cool. <laughs> but um, after I figured that out, like I mentioned to my Japanese friends, like bullshit. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I was like, so, oh, oh, so yeah, like a good a one, people good one, good one. <laughs> a lot of people listening to this would be like, you know, like what the hell, like. No one can own the waves. Like that's that's you know that's that that's the truth of the matter. But like that example of the car park issue and and uh, so in theory they're totally wrong what these guys are doing in theory. But there's kind of I don't know surfing's hard to explain in that you've got this pecking order in the lineup. Um, maybe you've got that in a martial arts gym too. You've got a bit of a pecking order, you know? Yeah, I mean, well, the thing, I think this is the difference between martial arts and surfing. In martial arts, well, I guess this is more of a problem in MMA, right? I think this is why, this is the difference between traditional martial arts and MMA. In MMA, uh, the hierarchy, but even then the hierarchy is still more, the hierarchy is still more visible, Right, so like you go into an MMA gym, you're gonna have the the owner. So you already know, hey, the owner. This is someone. So first of all, as I walk into this MMA gym, I need to respect everyone because everyone here has the potential to fuck me up, and that's just what you know, that's what you know walking in. That's what you know walking in, and you're talking about a very physical sport, and the repercussions are very real. Um, and then in the hierarchy, when you go into a different type of school, like the style I do, Kaju Kembo, you know, you're going to have people with black belts. So you're going to see an actual ranking system. And and we kind of, I'm not going to say we, we pick on each other, but there is a hierarchy and we follow that hierarchy. You know, if a black belt tells you to do something, you're not going to talk back to them. You're not going to talk back to really anyone because that's kind of how you walk in. You don't walk in with an attitude problem. You're not supposed to have an attitude problem. Attitude problems get fixed. That's why, yeah. that's why you're there. You're there to, if you have an attitude problem and you don't realize you have an attitude problem, they'll point out that you have an attitude problem. You're going to learn to fix your attitude problem when you do martial arts. But in surfing, it's there. That same concept is there. It's just nobody's wearing a black belt. So exactly, you don't know. And every time you go to a different spot, and I want to say the same thing. Here's where MMA is similar. So like, once I go to an MMA gym and I've established myself, like I always come and I respect everyone. And one of the things I always do is I look at their top fighters and I challenge them every time. Because the first thing I want to show everyone is that this is, these are my skills. I'm not saying I'm the best. I'm not saying I'm the worst. But I'm saying that I can keep up with your best. I may still lose to your best because the best changes, right? But I want to show you all my skill levels. And I kind of look at everyone in the room. And I immediately, if it's not the gym owner, I'll, I'll, I'll spar. If the gym owner is older, I'll spar against their best student, and I'll try my best. And, you know, sometimes I lose, sometimes I win. And that, I don't really look at it as a losing or winning experience. I just look at it as an experience. And then every time after that has been finished with, now the pecking order is established. Anybody who's lost to that guy know, knows where my skills are compared to that guy and i want to say in surfing it's very similar where when you get out there you paddle out you find out who the head person or there's always some guy who's like there every day who everybody knows um here in japan they're usually part of the beach cleanup and that's the guy who's going to be catching a lot of the waves or there with their with their family and they're catching all the waves or they're with their friends and catching all the waves. so it, it, in I approach surfing very similar to martial arts. I go there, I paddle out, I wait in line. There's kind of a line. You'll always notice it's like a line towards where the best waves are. And I wait in the far corner away from where everybody else is. And I'll wait for my first wave to come up. And I'll grab that wave and I will shred as hard as I <laughs> fucking can. Even if it's a two-foot wave, three-foot wave, I will bust out everything I possibly can. And then after I do that, I don't say much. And then I come back out, and then I'll notice immediately 
like people will start some of the people that may have just gotten there that day or wherever they're picking order is mm-hmm. uh, I'll start so slowly drifting to the front of that line <laughs> yeah <laughs> and um, I always I'm always really nice to everyone I always say good morning to everybody there from from the lowest of the picking order to the highest picking order in Japanese I say good morning to everyone even when I was in America I did the same thing I would always say hello to everyone ask them where they're from and just have a conversation with them yeah that, but, that's that's a secret too you know, if you've got that type of attitude, I think, like, and just, you know, getting back to that stuff, like, I, I've never had a problem with locals in Japan, but it exists. But I think, too, here, the problem you have is getting to the beach is quite expensive for young people, especially if they live in the city. You know, the toll roads and petrol, you know, you can spend a hundred bucks easy, right, driving down um, from one of the big cities to where the good waves are. So they put a lot of guys in one car. You might get five guys in a car. And and five guys hitting us one surf break at once is kind of not cool. So I understand why the locals do what they have to do because you've got an unregulated environment. You know, like you mentioned with the, the martial arts, you've got the, the owner, the black belts, the the hierarchy system, the surfing is totally, no one's wearing a belt or a T-shirt that says I'm, I'm number one, I'm number two, you know, like <laughs> yeah. you've got to work it out yourself. So I kind of understand where they're coming from. So I'm saying that if you just show up and you're, you're solo and you're polite and you do those things that you sort of mentioned, you wait, you're not going to have a problem. Yeah. Yeah, you know. So that was the sort of negative, but that's the positive of it too, you know. Yeah, and to anyone listening who's not a surfer, I mean, that's not just Japan. I mean, exactly. Yeah, that's that's pretty much that. That's the part of surfing that that you will not learn because no one. There's no manual. <laughs> that's right. There's no manual. <laughs> there's no manual. Like one thing I can say, I appreciate about the martial arts is, yeah, there is a manual. You you walk into a dojo. You walk. Into, I mean, first thing you walk in, you're going to see a giant poster, and it's going to have all the rules stated. It's stated on the wall, and the gym owner or the jujitsu head instructor, whoever's in charge, is going to give you a little pamphlet and say these are all the rules, and you please read the rules before you get started. Here's the contract. You sign a contract. You sign a waiver. But what's unsaid about surfing is. You signed a social contract that you weren't aware of. <laughs> and I think that's where a lot of the indiscrepancies and when I have seen drama out in the water, I think that's the one thing. It doesn't matter what level surfer you are, whether you're a pro or you're an amateur. I've seen pros go at it for the same thing. Um, they kind of forget that social contract. Cause it's, have you, have you uh, experienced much drama in Japan? In Japan? Like in the water? Not that much. The worst thing I ever experienced was when I was in uh, when I was in Wakayama. Oh yeah, Wakayama. Yeah. I uh, they I talked to. I called because I wanted to make sure there would be no drama. It yeah. was it was a flat day. The waves were literally like thirty centimeters under your knee, tiny, non-existent waves. So before I went, because I knew it was a small day, and I, went, I just wanted to get in the water because it's been a while, so I called the local office in Wakayama and said, hey, I have a SUP board, and I know that in that spot that we talked about, it has a sign, no SUP boarding. So they don't allow, I don't know, they, they get upset. They're, they're stating they'll get upset at you if you come out. For people that listening, was, for people so listening. Sorry, wait. Sorry. Sorry. Um, for people listening, a SUP board is a surfboard that you stand up on with a paddle. All right. Sorry, go ahead. Uh, when you say the local office, like the local council, like the local, uh, what do you call what, what's city, the local city, office? City council? Like city, the city, council. city hall. City hall, yeah. yeah. I call yeah. it city hall. And yeah, yeah, city hall is really open about that. Like I've called city hall in Awaji and uh, I've had certain spots where I've been my SUP board and I called the city hall and they're like, yeah. We only have a, this is only a swimming beach. We kind of don't like it if you do that. There's not a lot of space. Or sometimes they'll say, "Yeah, the surfers don't like it if you do that." So like, right? 
lot. Okay, they're, that's they're, cool. They're kind of they, they sometimes are in touch with what's happening. Yeah. And, and they said, yeah, no, that's fine. There's no problem. We allow surfing, and if you have a stand-up paddle board, that's fine. Just make sure. How long have you been doing it? I'm like, you know, I've been doing it for for over six years now. I know how to control my board. Like, okay, yeah, just make sure you don't you don't like uh, hit anyone with your board, <laughs> and uh, and and don't get in the way of the surfers. Like, you know, don't just pretty much be courteous, right? I'm like, ah, cool. I will. Yeah, yeah I'm, I'm not gonna. I'll do that. So I, I, I went out with my regular surfboard first to see if I could catch a few waves, and it was just boring, just way too boring because the waves are just too small. And um, I decided to bring out my sup board, and I drag it out, and just for extra verification, because I, I can see all the eyes, like they were staring at me in a negative way. And I was like, it's hard to tell whether I'm being stared at because I have a sup board or whether I'm being stared at because I'm, I'm a foreigner. So I asked the lifeguard, I'm like, hey, is it okay if I do this? He's like, yeah, yeah, it was fine. It's the same thing the city council said. Yeah, just don't bump into anyone. Or, uh, like, right, cool, cool. So I, I bring up, I, I put my, my board in the water, and everyone that was just talking to me that was really friendly is now giving me kind of a scowl, but they're not saying anything. So I'm like, all right, I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna paddle out into the ocean and stay away from the shore because I'm not even here to catch waves anyway. Like I can, but they're tiny waves. It doesn't matter. So, so I did. I decided to paddle all the way out into the ocean. A good over 500 meters for sure. Like everyone looked tiny from where I was. From where I was, and I, I also courteously, I didn't, I didn't stand up right away. Like I, I paddled on my t- on my stomach past the breaker, which was way past everybody else, and then I stood up. And then this guy, I see this guy waving from shore, and he's like, I see tiny arms waving, and I'm literally wondering, like, because he's a little bit past the breakers, and I thought. Maybe this guy's like got a problem. Maybe maybe he needs help, right? Because <laughs> because he's like trying to wave me down, and I'm like, ah, I'm not gonna go over there because I don't want to bother the surfers, the locals. So I'm just gonna stay on the deep water. And then he starts paddling towards me, and I I'm thinking maybe maybe he sees something I don't. Maybe they announce that we're all supposed to get out of the water. Who knows? So I, I start paddling towards him. And he tells me, he tells me, uh, he tells me in Japanese, akan, in, in our area, which means no, not allowed, not allowed. And he starts making the X, no, not allowed, you're not allowed. And, and then I told him in Japanese, like, you know, I'm sorry, uh, you know, and, uh, and what they said, I call, I told him in Japanese, hey, I called the city office, they said it's okay. I talked to the lifeguard, he said it's okay. I didn't know. And don't, don't worry about it. I'm not going to go out to your spot. I'm just going to go out into the ocean. So, so I said, Daiju was like, no, it's not okay. He kept saying, it's not okay. You have to get out of the water. And then, like, he reached over to, like, grab my leash. And that's when I told him, Akan, don't. <laughs> really? That's when I told him, don't. Don't. And then he's like, and he looked at me, I'm like, don't. And then I turned my paddle around in an aggressive fashion, <laughs> and I said "akan" to him. And then he got mad and just paddled back to his friends. But um, wow! But like, because my deal is, look, I talked to the city, I talked to the lifeguard. Um, you seem to be a loner here. I'm not bothering you. I'm not surfing. Now that I know that you guys don't want me here. I'm already here. There's nothing I can do about that. And I came, like you said, people travel. I traveled two hours. I paid my fees. I'm going to stay away from you. I'm not going to surf in your area. I'm literally going to go out into the ocean and be around some boats. I don't see how that bothers you. I don't see why that should bother you. If the city council said I'm allowed to use my quote-unquote vessel out in the open water, then we're in open water. So, like... I'm not taking your wave. I don't see what your deal is. So, yeah, that was my bad, quote unquote, bad experience in Japan. It wasn't that bad, you know. And, and do you think like that guy was trying to just say face in front of all the other locals, or do you think he's just having a bad day? And yeah, I think, you know, yeah, I think. Do you, you think about it like after? Because it's pretty silly. Like you're 500 meters away. <laughs> He's got to exert all this energy. Yeah, I know. <laughs> and the and the waves are knee high anyway. 
um, what, what, what's your take? My, like, this is my take on it, and this is something that I think um, well, I've become aware of. If, if one sups out there, then another one will show up, and another one, and another one. Don't think that's a very Japanese thing. Do you find, like, for some reason they like crowds? Yeah, yeah. And he's just trying, and he's, like, just trying to protect. Like, it's not really directed at you. It is directed at you, but it's kind of, like, directed at the bigger picture. Yeah. Is that well, yeah. In, what I, what he's I, being a dick, but trying to defend him in a, in a weird way. Do you know what I'm saying? Yeah, he, he's, thinking, he's thinking more long game, if that makes any sense. And I, I'm, I'm thinking more, like, short term. And that's why, like, like, the decision I made in my mind at that point was, like, look, I'm already here. I'm not going to do this ever again. Like yeah. now that I know that it's not okay, I'm not going to come back here with my sub board ever again. And yeah. also check one, check two, you tried to, you, you tried to grab my leash <laughs> and that's where like, and, and this is a difference. I think he was trying to save face in front of his friends. Because once, yeah. once I came back out and I was going to put my stuff, I had another girl surfer in a very nice way tell me it's not allowed. And then I told her, yeah, I know. You know, like, I, I already had a problem earlier. And um, I'm not going to take this board out here anymore. Um, this is this is my, pretty much my last time. It's just this, the waves are small, and that's why I decided to do that. Like, okay. And she was totally cool. She's like, yeah, I understand that. And we all kind of just let it go. Right. But, um, yeah. So like, I, I don't, I'm not necessarily mad at him, but the, like, you asked me that what well, my worst experience was, well, that was my worst experience. Like I, I had to wonder like if I, if this guy rips me off my board and we end up in an altercation, like over something which is dumb exactly. <laughs> over, nice. over nothing over nothing so I, I mean i really think and that's why like i didn't i mean i could have easily escalated that but um you know the way i looked at it was this guy's probably just frustrated the waves are like i said because the waves are 30 centimeters there's no waves to be caught um He's having a bad day. He's probably just sitting out there for hours with no nothing to do, and that's probably what he just said. Take it out on me. So like, yeah. And I mean, obviously, and I, honestly, like, I, after I told my wife, I'm like, there's just certain places that are just like that. Like, not just Japan. Like, that was my worst experience. And like after that, I, I just put a check. Like, you know, I've always felt. I've seen in Wakayama. I've seen surfers yell at other surfers before, like, and yep. I'm, I'm almost get into fights and stuff. And the time I went to Wakayama before that, I had a, when I was driving out of the parking lot, um, I had some guys start honking behind me and I pulled over thinking that maybe I strapped my board on wrong to my car. And then he pulled next to me in English said, fuck you. Cause he felt I was driving too slow or something. So like, I've already had bad experiences in Wakayama before. Right. So, like, after that, that was, like, strike one with the guy saying, fuck you. And I'm like, dude, wait, what? Like, <laughs> oh, what? <laughs> like, you know what I mean? This has nothing to do with surfing. This just has to do with kind of an overall aggressive attitude. You felt I wasn't driving fast enough. And, like, so, like, after this second negative experience, I wasn't going to wait around for a third. Because, um, yeah, I just feel like, you know what? People out here are just kind of dicks. And uh, I'm not going to I'm not going to surf here anymore. And it's not because yeah. they're Japanese. Same thing happened at Trestles. I'm from San Diego. I stopped surfing Trestles for the same reason. I remember I, I followed the same rule. I paddled out. I was in the far corner. I was actually not even at Trestles. Uh, there's another spot next to Trestles called Churches, which is on the military base. So I paddled out in the military base, which is a spot over from Trestles. But the line to Trestles is so long that sometimes people will drift over to the other spot on the military base. And I was in the far corner just watching, just watching people surf. Because I'm like, all right, and there's a lot of pros out here. And I remember this one girl was riding, and it was a great day, like beautiful weather. Uh, El Nino surge coming in, swell. So it was a good uh, double overhead. Again, it was like 
six to six to ten feet for the people listening that look at stuff as feet. Good three meter waves, three to four meters, and uh, nicely timed sets. It wasn't as crazy. It was really easy to pedal out. And this girl was just ripping on this wave, and I was just watching. I was, you know, I was sitting there on on in the back of the line watching her shred, and as she comes up on the top of the wave, she looks at me, and I'm just smiling, and she says, "Back off, asshole!" <laughs> <laughs> I was just like, "Whoa!" <laughs> Whoa. <laughs> I, was, <laughs> I had absolutely no intention to take the wave. I wasn't even laying on the board. I was uh, sitting. I was sitting on the board, just watching the line. And I, and I, at that experience, I was like, you know what? I don't think I'm going to come here anymore. I don't. Mm. This isn't. I, I can find a similar wave uh, 20, 30 minutes down in this place called Oceanside. And uh, it's a family beach. And there's not a bunch of people competing there because it is a family beach. And all the surfers there have more of a family attitude. And they try not, you know, they, they, a lot of the surfers bring their kids out, so they, they don't want to bring that kind of negative energy to the, around their children. And I'm like, yeah, I think, uh, I think this is the last time I'm going to surf trestles. <laughs> Classic. <laughs> Back off, asshole. <laughs> That's so funny. <laughs> so, a little going towards our wrap up here. Ian. Yeah. Um,. What advice do you have for someone who wants to start surfing? Wow. I think um, the main thing is to, to start, to give it a go. Um, but you need, you need to get the right, the right board, you know, obviously making surfboards. You see a lot of people get influenced by people that sort of, you know, they just want to get what their friends are riding and, and if you want to start surfing, you need a lot of foam. So there's an old saying, foam is your friend. So start with like a, like if you're a real beginner, start with one of those soft boards um, and make sure you get something big, a lot of foam. And go to beaches that aren't crowded and uh, you're not going to get in anyone's way. And probably probably have a couple of lessons with a with a good, you know, an ex, an ex pro surfer who's a surf instructor, you know, there's plenty of those guys around on, on beaches these days advertising surf lessons. And then just be patient, you know. If you're not going to get um, really good really quick with surfing, you're just going to have to practice a lot. And I mean, practice a lot, like every day and go out in all conditions, but just don't put your life in danger. You know, <laughs> that makes sense. No, no, that makes, that makes a lot of sense. Surfing is a dangerous sport. So definitely understanding where you are and your skill set is not only safe for you, but safe for everyone else involved too. So. Yeah. All right, man. Um, my last question. What? Yep. What are your plans for the future? Uh, wh- what's your contact? Is there any any plug in any plugs you want to put in for your for your com- for your company for your business? Um, yeah, of course. Well, my plan is to, to surf as much as I can <laughs> till the day I die. <laughs> good plan. <laughs> till my body allows me to. That's a good um, plan. You know, and on the business side of things, yeah. If you if you really want some, we we tend to make. Um, sort of high-end surfboards, Um, you know, they're all custom-made. They take a little while to make. They take, like, we don't make stuff you can just buy um, off the rack, they call it, which is, you know, it's sitting in a shop. We actually um, custom design the board for the person and their ability and and what they want, where they're going to use it. So check out what we do. It's called formulaenergy.com.au on the on the web, and if you if you have you know you want some advice on things or surfboards, just email me and I'll try and give you some honest good advice. You know. All right, cool. So, like, 
for my uh, for, for my viewers, you, I'm gonna have uh, you can see it right here on the screen. Uh, also, check the YouTube description for the video. I'm gonna have the website there. For my listeners, uh, if you're listening to the podcast, look in the episode notes, and I'll have a link to his website. You can just hit contact and send an email over to Hayden and get back to you. Sweet. Cool. Well, brother, thank you very much for being on the show. Um, I, 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 I almost want to have you maybe in the future come back again and talk about Win Chun, but I, I, I really did enjoy talking about both surfing and martial arts and the similarities between the two uh, and you share yeah. both stories. That's, that was really cool. Yeah. I'm a very, very amateur martial artist, but I did, I did enjoy my time when I was writing to it. So good luck with it. Right on. Well, thank you. For my listeners, right. for my listeners, uh, stay tuned for the wrap up. All right. So this is the wrap up. I hope you enjoyed today's podcast. Uh, as I mentioned earlier in some of the last few episodes, I did a stand up set at Lingua Cafe. It was a lot of fun. Uh, big thanks to Christopher Clark for throwing down some tunes to my bad jokes. It is something that I enjoyed and we'll be getting more into. And I'll keep all of you posted with some of my comedy dates out here in Japan if you want to see me live. Again, if you want to support the show, YouTube, hit subscribe. If you're listening to this, uh, just please jump on YouTube. You can Google Social Jello with Angelo, click videos. My YouTube channel will come up. Hit subscribe. If I can get enough subscribers, uh, hopefully that can lead to something better. I really appreciate it. And I'll catch you all later. Peace.